far, we've covered garage conversions, multifamily ADUs, unpermitted ADUs, and last month we had a legislative update. I am Timothy Pollack with the Casita Coalition, former senior planner and plan review specialist for the city of San Diego and Solana Beach. My education is in architecture and organizational development, and I've been deeply immersed in the ADU space reviewing over 1,500 properties for ADU development in municipalities throughout California. I'm also an educator and administrator for the San Diego Community College District focusing on business and information technology. This webinar series would not be possible without the support of our sponsors and promotional partners. I'd like to first start out by thanking our major sponsors of the webinar series, Meta and Wells Fargo. Additional sponsors include the Sowers team of Cross Country Mortgage, Building Industry Association of the Bay Area, and law firms of Allen, Matkins, Rubin, Junius, and Rose. Our most recent sponsors also include premier members, uh, Sonder Ponds, Golden Age Financial, Holland and Knight, and Abodu. We would also like to recognize our promotional partners for the webinar series, who are aligned with the mission here at Casita Coalition and uh, for creating more housing opportunities statewide. A few short announcements. Casita Coalition hosts a monthly virtual roundtable for ADU and small housing industry professionals on the second Tuesdays at noon. This call is for our business members and those thinking about being members and thinking about joining the Casita Coalition. Please email jared at casitacoalition.org for more information. We've released the third installment of our ADU homeowner video series highlighting stories of how ADUs are helping homeowners meet their financial and family needs. See them on our, our YouTube channel. We share a new video each Monday. Our guidebooks on small housing subjects are available for download on our website. Our SB9 guidebook for our homeowners is up now and a more detailed version for housing professionals will be coming later this month. We've also launched a blog with small housing topics of interest and webinar summaries. Check it out on our website and our social media channels. So without further delay, I am very pleased to introduce today's introductory speaker, Senator Tony Atkins, President Pro Tem of the California State Senate. State President Pro Tempor Tony Atkins first served in the State Assembly for six years, and then in 2016, she was elected to represent California's 39th district where she was instrumental in getting key pieces of house legislation passed, including SB2, which created a permanent source of funding for affordable housing, and SB9, the subject of today's webinar. Throughout her career, Atkins has been a champion for affordable housing, the natural environment, healthcare, veterans, women, and the LBGTQ community. Welcome, Senator Atkins. Well, Timothy, thank you. And uh, first, let me say my name is not Tylisa Sudbury. I am technologically inept. And so uh, that's my scheduler in San Diego. But uh, I, I want to thank you for inviting me to be part of uh, the forum today. And I, you know, the coalition, uh, I appreciate so much you give me a chance to just share a few words. I know how passionate everyone on this call is about addressing our housing crisis. Housing and home ownership is actually very personal to me. Uh, my parents never owned a home. And, you know, I was in my 30s before I could afford a home my, of my own in California. So it's uh, today's housing crisis has become an issue so large, however, that there really isn't a single solution. And I want people like my family, my parents, myself, to be able to be part of home ownership, but also to have access to affordable housing. So um, there is no single solution. I think you all know that. However, I think SB9, much like all of the work around the ADU legislation, these are critical pieces of trying to address the crisis from multiple perspectives. So this bill is not only a priority of mine, but the Senate Housing Lead Group, which I put together, worked tirelessly for a number of years on a package of bills to improve housing production in our state across the board. I think you've witnessed that over the last several years as we've ramped up because of the nature of the crisis to try to do more. SB9 is, I think, a significant bill that received sharp criticism 
uh, from localities across the state. But ultimately what passed is really a tool for working families and homeowners. It's that component. SB9 sought to strike a balance on the local discretion. So it's kind of disappointing to see that some of the municipalities are abusing it already, are trying to avoid implementation. Um, in the five months uh, out since the law went into effect, I remain committed to continuing the oversight of SB9, uh, the implementation, and appreciate really the ongoing partnership with the administration, uh, and specifically Housing and Community Development, HCD, as you know them, and especially our Attorney General, Rob Bonta. He's been very clear uh, to cities that uh, have tried to shirk or find their way around implementation of SB9. We've never expected that change uh, resulting from SB9 would happen overnight. In fact, we know that it won't, which is why the outpouring of opposition to it seems sort of uh, really over, uh, I mean, over the top crazy. Uh, the types of zoning changes will take time. Uh, we know that families are struggling as housing prices continue to rise so that the disparities in wealth gap, especially the racial wealth gap, and of course we see what's happening with the Federal Reserve now um, and interest rates. Nevertheless, we have to keep moving forward on any and every solution we can on housing production, which is going to give more opportunities to people. So I'm really proud of the priorities the legislature has set forth in this year's budget as well which is gonna include the California Dream for All program, uh, building on the historic zoning changes and investments in housing programs that we accomplished in 2021. Uh, we know home ownership is key to really accessing the California Dream and it creates a path to the middle class. It did for me. It allows families to live where they work to provide their kids with better educational opportunities and better health outcomes, frankly. But bills like SB9 that encourage more housing production are gonna to continue to be key to addressing those kind of socioeconomic barriers, racial barriers that have prevented equity in housing and communities. Um, as we look ahead, I, I just want you to know uh, that my Senate colleagues and I remain committed to joining you in the work of creating housing opportunities for all. Uh, I wanna thank you for the work that you've done and continue to focus on as it relates to ADU implementation and um, for giving me time to be part of today's discussion. So Timothy, I think I turn it back to you with my yes. great appreciation. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Atkins. And I was really, it was great to see you in San Diego and spend some one-on-one time looking at some ADUs. Uh, so it was great. Thank you for taking the time to meet with us and for all your, uh, your work in the space. Um, now today's webinar, um, our moderator will introduce our two presenters, then open it up for your questions. You may submit questions for presenters and panelists. And we are using the Q&A button. Um, many times we're used to using the chat button, so we are not gonna be using the chat button. It will be using the question and answer button, the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Jared Baszler, Director of Strategic Initiatives for the Casita Coalition. Jared, over to you. Thanks, Timothy. Well, there he is, all right. Yeah. Uh, so our presenters this morning are going to be Kevin Ash and Mohammed Almeldin. Um, Al Almeldin, sorry. Uh, Kevin Ash is an attorney with Holland and Knight and a member of the firm's West Coast Land Use and Environmental Group. Mr. Ash's practice focuses on environmental and land use law, with a particular emphasis on the permitting of residential mixed use and renewable energy projects in California. Kevin's practice also involves due diligence and permitting of ADUs, and he's represented numerous ADU applicants in both Northern and Southern California, uh, and he's based out of San Diego. Mohammed Alameldin is uh, currently policy associate for UC Berkeley's Turner Center, where he turns innovative research to inform housing policy at the local, state, and federal levels. Uh, he's written for and been cited in a variety of publications from Cal Matters to The Atlantic. So I'll hand over to the two of you to get our presentations going. Perfect, and I will share my screen right now. Uh, one second. Can you see my presentation, Jared? Okay, great. Well, thanks for the introduction, and I'm very pleased to be back here uh, presenting to the Casita Coalition. Um, this is my third time presenting to, at a Casita Coalition webinar, um, but the first time where I'm going to be discussing a law where the actual lawmaker that drafted the bill um, has been invited, so I will try very hard not to disgrace myself <laughs> by either misstating the law or, or a misapplication of it. 
Um, but it's great to be back. Um, a little bit more just about my practice before I dive in. I, I help um, ADU applicants and uh, now SB9 applicants, whether they're individuals or um, you know companies that specialize in the prefabricated space, um, develop these projects in California. Um, and I've even assisted the Casita Coalition with drafting guidance and, and monitoring um, developments for SB9. So I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to be discussing just a, a very high level overview of what SB9 is and what the re qualifying requirements are. Um, I'm assuming that most people on the call have heard of SB9 and, and you might have varying degrees of knowledge over what the criteria are, but I'll just be quickly covering what that um, what the statute provides. Uh, and then I'm going to be going into a little bit of what we're seeing in practice, um, whether they're roadblocks at the local level or HCD interpretations of SB9's requirements. I'll be talking a little bit more about how SB9 has been implemented um, now that it's taken effect as of January uh, 1st of this year. Okay, so quickly, uh, just moving along, um, it's important to talk at a high level that SB9 basically has two types of provisions. Um, they can be, the law can be kind of divided in two where the first set of provisions allow the ministerial approval of up to two units on a lot. And the second set of provisions, which I'll be discussing later, um, allow for urban lot splits, um, so splitting lots in, in urban areas. Um, it's important to note that these laws can be worked together in tandem, but that's not a, it's not a mandate. You don't have to do a lot split and apply for two units. You can just use the provisions applying for two units um, in and of themselves. So these provisions apply, um, basically provide for the ministerial approval of housing developments containing no more than two units on a single family zone part parcel. Ministerial approval is a term of art. You've, you're, if you're working in California, you, you probably know it well. Typically applies to things like building permits and grading permits that are approved at the staff level rather than things like conditional use permits or general plan amendments that require planning commission approval and a hearing and subjective criteria on behalf of, um, of the local agency. So here, um, the provisions of SB9 say that local agencies may apply objective standards only, but only to the extent it wouldn't prohibit at least two, sorry, two units that are 800 square foot each on a parcel that adhere to four foot rear and side yard setbacks. So that provision of objective standards is really important because that means that they can own, that the that local agencies can only apply verifiable and sometimes quantifiable standards that are known both to agency staff and the applicant ahead of time. Um, things like height limits, um, setbacks, I just said four foot rear and side yard setbacks, um, things like lot coverage, they can't apply subjective standards like is this development consistent with the neighborhood character? Um, are there adequate provisions for access, sufficient privacy? These aren't object these aren't objective because they're not verifiable up front. Um, to qualify for these this duplex or two unit uh, ministerial approval, the project needs to be located in a city or an urbanized uh, portion of an unincorporated county. Um, your site has to satisfy a number of environmental site conditions um, that are found in SB 35, another area of housing law. Um, you, it's best to just go to the statute itself, but some of them are your site can't be located uh, along a delineated earthquake fault or in sensitive species or plant habitat. However, unlike SB 35, you can be actually located in the coastal zone. So SB 9 projects are allowed in the coastal zone. Um, there are also um, provisions that would disqualify a project depending on um, the existing occupants of the site. So a project, you can't basically demolish or alteration any of the existing housing on a site in connection with your project. If the housing is deed restricted for affordability levels, subject to a rent control ordinance or can, has contained a, a, a rental tenant um, in the last three years. So moving really quickly along. Um, so that was the ministerial approval for up to two units or the duplexes. This is the, the other second half of SB9 provides ministerial approval for urban lot slits sorry, urban lot splits. 
Um, most of the same qualifying criteria for two unit projects also apply, but some that are different for lot splits is that each of the parcels needs to be at least 40% of the original parcel size. So you can kind of consider this like a 60-40 rule or a 50-50 rule. You can't do 80-20 or 70-30. Um, and the same thing, uh, local agencies are confined to applying only objective standards um, to the extent it wouldn't preclude um, uh, I think that's a, a misstatement here um, from the prior um, slide, but um, basically to to only apply objective standards in doing urban lot splits. Um, SB9 doesn't have any requirement though that agencies have to approve some sort of parcel map, but judging from a lot of ordinances, each city is gonna have different procedural and application requirements for how to apply for and approve a lot split. Um, we're asked a lot about the number of units that's, um, you know, what's the building potential basically from using SB9. Um, the numbers will see the same, but it, it really, the, the analysis can kind of change about the interrelationship with existing ADU law, depending on if you're proposing a lot split or if you're not. Um, this is a position that HCD has kind of endorsed in their SB9 um, fact sheet and also letters to different jurisdictions now on SB9 ordinances. So if you if you're not doing a lot split and you're just using SB9, um, a local agency must allow the two units under SB9 and can use and you and must adhere to uh, ADU law as well. So one of the combinations that we're hearing now is that you build two primary units in a duplex, but you can still utilize the existing provisions of state ADU law to get potentially an ADU and a JADU provided other qualifying criteria are met. So that's how you get to four units on one lot without doing a lot split. Um, if you're doing a lot split, the law is a little bit different on the treatment of ADU laws and that there's no requirement that an agency, um, you know, permit ADUs in addition to whatever the potential is under SB9. So all of these units count, whether it's the primary unit, an ADU or a JDU, um, those all come into the equation for two units on each lot for four total. So some of the scenarios are you do two primary units on each lot, duplexes, a primary unit and an ADU on each lot. Um, those are some of the, the, the kind of scenarios that you can play around with. Um, one thing I'll, now I'm gonna move towards kind of implementation, some of the issues we're seeing. Um, one of the things that HCD is, has done is sent a, a letter that's relatively recent to the city of Pasadena um, after their uh, adoption of an ADU ordinance, um, which has kind of clarified what I what my last slide, but it also had a very other important point. Um, the ordinance that the city of Pasadena had considered at one point would have prohibited lot splits for parcels that had a primary dwelling and an existing ADU that was developed, you know, in the past few years under the new amended state ADU laws. Um, HCD said that that's not okay, uh, taking the position that that's not okay because um, there's no prohibition in SB9 um, regarding that. So if you've got an ADU uh, on site, there's no disqualification. It, it might play around with the numbers um, that you're allowed to be permitted, but it shouldn't prohibit you from any of the, the lot split um, provisions. Some other things that we're seeing in the market um, for implementation issues. Um, now that various, uh, various cities and counties in the Northern and Southern California have adopted urgency SB9 ordinance or now official SB9 ordinances. And um, I think I would not be stepping out of line and saying that they follow the fine letter of the law in various degrees. Um, one of the things that HCD in reviewing SB9 ordinances, if given a complaint, is are these ordinances completely different standards applying the R1 zoning regulations or do they apply what the city has done for many years to single family residential development in an R1 zone to new SB9 projects? Um, HCD has taken the position and encouraged jurisdictions that to the extent possible, they should apply the pre-existing zoning regulations that have applied to those developments in the years before SB9 was adopted. So while the legality of this is, is I won't get into now, this is something that people should be aware of is that new SB9 ordinances might come along and say, we're gonna do a 16 foot height limit. Whereas 
in the R1 zone for decades before we've allowed two stories and 35 feet. Something to just be on the look at, look out for. Um, one other thing is that SB9 says that local agencies can apply objective standards as long as it doesn't prohibit the development of up to two units that are 800 square foot each. The way I read that, that that's kind of a minimum. A local agency can do it as long as they don't prevent two 800 square foot units. However, what we're seeing is that some jurisdictions are taking that minimum and they're really establishing it as caps in their ordinances that you cannot build more than 800 square foot two units. Um, so something to be on the lookout if you're working in different jurisdictions. Um, another thing too is um, I just talked about the 60-40 rule um, for the lot splits that each lot has to be at least 60% or sorry, at least 40% of, of its pre-lot split size and um, 1,200 square feet. But what we're also seeing is that other jurisdictions, some jurisdictions are applying minimum lot width and depth requirements. So you might have a situation where your proposed lot split would meet the 60-40 rule and it would be at least 1,200 square feet, but due to some weird configurations on how wide or deep it is, you're gonna be disqualified under, the, under that ordinance. So some, again, something to be aware of. Um, I won't talk about this last one um, in depth, but I think if you follow these issues closely and have a Google alert or Twitter, this was probably all over your radar. But um, in January of 2022, the town of Woodside kind of put a, I would, wouldn't call it a moratorium, but something to the effect of hold on all SB9 applications uh, under the theory that the entirety of the town was uh, mountain lion protected habitat. Um, this attracted an, uh, a letter from uh, the attorney general and, and um, really angered the public. Um, you can't do these wholesale, wholesale and, um, uh, sensitive habitat cat cat uh, categories. You have to actually do that on a site specific basis. Uh, and there, there are really, there are tools in place to do that. Um, the last thing I will say, I'll go through this slide quickly before I hand it off to Mohammed at the Turner Center uh, to give his portion of the presentation. But these are some of, I, I would call them application tips based on my experience of what I've seen um, jurisdictions do um, so far in 2022. Uh, I've posted it as a Q&A, as, as corny as that sounds, but I think it's a good way to convey the message and my points. Um, one thing that we're seeing is an, a, a local city or county say, um, you know, your development is not doing a lot split, but you're just proposing one unit. And SB9 doesn't apply because technically that applies to duplexes and lot splits or duplexes or lot splits. That's not, that's not what the law says. The law says you can utilize SB9 for up to two units, one or two. And HCD has endorsed this position in their fact sheet. So um, you can use SB9 for one unit projects and don't back down if a city uh, is attempting to tell you otherwise. Uh, another one that's a little bit tricky is SB9 is uh, to qualify for SB9, you have to be uh, single, uh, 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 it has to be a single family zone. A lot of jurisdictions have the, the normal R1, R2, um, you know, agriculture, open space, multifamily, where it's, a, it's easier to tell whether you qualify or don't based on your zoning. I think that there's an argument to be made, however, that well, you can't use it in multifamily zones or, or mixed use zones. If it is a nebulous naming convention of what your zone is, but, per, but for all intents and purposes, it is a single family zone, you should be able to use um, uh, um, the, the SB9 provisions to your benefit. Um, the last two I'll quickly go before handing it off to Mohammed is uh, another thing that we're seeing is um, applicants are trying to submit SB9 applications and a city will say, uh, we can process this, but we're working on our SB9 ordinance. And it really behooves you to just wait a few months before we've got our provisions in place. Um, if there's a draft SB9 ordinance available, please feel free to review that and see if it helps or hurts you. But I have a hard time believing that that would be the case. There's nothing to prevent you from filing an SB9 application now after January 1st of 2022. And you can also submit something called an SB330 preliminary application to vest the objective standards that are in, a play, in effect at that time. Um, but please confer with legal counsel uh, before you use an SB, if you consider or have any questions about the applicability of SB330. Um, the last thing on this list is that sometimes we see uh, 
typically some of the smaller, more remote jurisdictions say, fine, we'll process your, you know, your ADU or your SB9 application ministerially, but we've got this architectural committee that really has to review everything um, that goes through the city. Um, I would try to push back on that or because this is subject to ministerial review or you can say, OK, but that that body is really confined to reviewing objective criteria, not things like neighborhood character, not things like um, a Mediterranean style, if there's no quantifiable or verifiable way to do that. Um, so you really need to kind of keep um, this these types of committees roles um, really clear up front um, to so it doesn't cause a, an issue later on for your project. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing my screen and turn things over to Mohammed. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, does everyone see my screen? Yes. And everyone hears me? Perfect. Um, thank you so much, um, Kevin, for your presentation. Those application tips will really come in handy. And I personally learned a lot from that. Uh, my name is Mohammed el I am the policy associate for the Turner Center, and I've spent the last few months on analysis on SB9 implementation and how cities are um, implementing and interpreting the law. Uh, our previous report um, on SB9 emphasized that market feasible parcels are contingent on property owners' interest and construction costs, as well as uh, local factors such as um, contractor capacity and the availability of appropriate mortgage products. Central to this is local implementation. Uh, the ways that localities implement this law will have a significant impact on new home building enabling California. The following analysis looks at how cities are implementing SB9 uh, differently and explores how these uh, regulations might facilitate new home construction or hinder it. To better understand how each city's specific requirements might impact SB9 uptake, we examined 10 cities with SB9, implementing order, uh, SB9 ordinances. The cities were selected based on their size and geography and reflect different types of communities found across the state. It's important to note that a majority of cities in the Central Valley and the Inland Empire have not adopted SB9 ordinances by the time of this analysis and were therefore not included. The interesting thing about uh, local implementation is that by looking at this graph that um, the feasible parcels are 410,000 units, uh, due to local implementation, it might be even less than um, what we analyzed back in uh, the summer of 2021. As a quick overview on top of um, what Kevin has presented earlier is that as design, SB9 allows implementation to implement the law using their own objective design standards and um, limitations and allows for the imposition of additional restrictions outside of a baseline required by the bill. Uh, local jurisdictions have two options. They could adopt the law as is or create a custom um, implementing ordinance. Um, as well, Senate Bill 9 allows for varying levels of local discretion where local inter ordinances may not physically preclude a duplex, but they could make it economically infeasible to build one. Uh, it's important to note that these loose conditions have created a massive statewide laboratory of sorts. Over 500 jurisdictions each have an opportunity on how to implement SB 9, and in the cities we've examined, no two ordinances were alike. Also, homeowner associations are allowed to ban SB9 lot splits, a practice outlawed for statewide ADU standards, thereby allowing some, um, organizations at the most local level to further limit um, parcel um, feasibility. Uh, the common areas where we've observed um, where local discretion could limit and bolster SB9 uptake were through the following, just uh, unit design standards, um, maximum unit size, height limitations, architectural design, affordability requirements. Um, we found that some cities impose affordability requirements that are likely to severely limit the uptake of SB9 uh, lot splits. Use of land. Uh, we've seen that even with um, 
good actors or not really good actors, but people that really want to implement the law, that there are still significant easements. Um, other um, localities had like relaxed um, standards when it came to easements. The important thing to note when it comes to easements is that like a significant easement might geometrically make it um, impossible for flag lots to be created, um, further limiting um, parcel eligibility. Some localities actually banned flag lots outright, um, but there were also uses of land standards, right? Um, like SB9 limits rear and side setbacks to four feet maximum. There was no limitation on front setbacks. Um, they might describe parking requirements differently or require open space courtyards or landscaping requirements. Um, the famous one would be like a, five, a 15 gallon hedge or surrounding the property. Um, ultimately, we found that among the 10 cities we've analyzed, um, seven of them required objective design standards for SB9 um, lot splits that were stricter than was required for single family homes or even ADUs. To go a bit in depth in the examples that we've um, analyzed when it comes to um, those four central themes, uh, for unit design requirements, um, our residential land use survey um, from 2019 found that the median height limit for single family homes across California is about approximately 30 feet. Um, the, multi the medium height limit for a multifamily home is 35 square, uh, 35 feet um, high. San Jose and San Diego, oh, wait. there are cities that have um, height limits that track with the statewide median. Um, but six cities um, that we've seen implement SB9 ordinances, it was under um, 20 feet. Moreover, many of these cities have maximum um, size for new units close to the minimum size required by state law, uh, the 800 square foot maximum, as um, described by Kevin. Then for architectural design, when it comes to unit design standards, uh, cities have um, specific exterior um, materials that must be used, exact size requirements for parts of the buildings, um, increase, um, ultimately increasing the cost of the units and limiting the use of more affordable construction methods like modular or prefabricated housing units. Why would um, a, a prefab factory um, do the specific um, architectural designs for a locality that might have just like less than 100 SB9 law splits? We've also seen um, one player implement lead platinum certification when it comes to an SB9 lot split, similar to what's required in stadiums uh, to, hinder free, um, to hinder the use of the law. Next, we saw um, affordability as a major theme. Um, in our analysis, four cities require de um, deed-restricted affordable housing. Um, two cities adopted a practice that deed-restricted affordable housing also required affordable impact fees, making it much more difficult for projects to pencil. Um, such requirements can be well-intended, but deed restricted affordable housing requirements may make it challenging or impossible for projects to pencil without subsidies or offsets, especially for a homeowner that can't really navigate the, uh, or has the technical expertise to, um, to build an affordable housing unit. Then we've um, examined for use of land um, requirements we found that four out of the 10 cities in our sample require significant easements. Uh, an easement's a legal right for a person or an entity to access a property owned by someone else for a limited or specific purpose uh, or other land uses that may significantly limit the uptake of SB9 by spatially constraining what can be built. Uh, as I've said before, significant easements can reduce parcel eligibility in cities and, some, and make them ineligible by just making flag lots impossible to build or straight banning them. Uh, the state doesn't have a requirement for some front setbacks. And we've seen that some cities are implementing a 40 foot front setback for an SB9 law split. The median, um, due to our analysis, the median um, for a front setback is around 20 feet statewide. We've also analyzed parking. Um, there's a car dependent city that eliminated off street parking um, and restricted on site, um, on street, overnight passes for residents with SB9 units. So you have a car dependent city, and if you build an SB9 unit, you cannot have parking on the street or, um, in the, or on the unit itself. Um, so applicants are required to have their driveways removed or curb cuts removed or repaired. Um, 
And there's also open space requirements. So the city requires 125 square foot, um, like courtyard in the middle. Another one requires 600 square feet that isn't surrounded by the occupying structures, parking, driveways, and must be shared with the two units. Um, open space requirements are like, when it comes to like planting trees or open space requirements, if they're the same standards as single family homes, it wasn't um, something to really like raise an eyebrow about, but um, it was just a common practice for cities that already don't have those practices. Um, and we've seen two cities actually have more lenient standards than their single family homes, hoping to bolster development for SB9 law splits. Uh, so the term center, uh, we've had a few just policy recommendations for local governments so they could lean into on um, this future, this land use law. Um, really, uh, it's important that localities understand that HCD has a technical assistance um, guidelines for um, how to implement SB9. Uh, so you wouldn't get a letter, so they don't get a letter from the AG or from HCD like um, Kevin has shown. And uh, um, the Association of Bay Area Governments has SB9 templates, um, draft staff reports, PowerPoint presentations, architectural designs, overview graphics, and even missing middle housing workshops. By utilizing these sources at the state and regional level, um, cities have the option to bolster the effects of SB9. We've seen um, two cities have a practice that has that makes it very easy to see um, eligible parcels that could utilize SB9, easy to read checklists, clear information on project um, timelines, so then homeowners are encouraged to um, implement the law. Uh, we also recommend that uh, pre-approved designs and same day permitting, similar to what we've seen in San Jose with ADUs, uh, localities can implement this similar practice when it comes to SB9 lot splits to make it um, easier for homeowners to wanna to use the law, I mean, especially if they have no building expertise. And we also analyzed that, you know, localities can lean into the law if they want to ensure that um, it's a, a more holistic approach. They can help incubate nonprofits or um, small builders, similar to Oakland's Keys to Equity program. Or if they want affordable housing, they could replicate um, Pasadena's ADU construction loan program, where they loan money for an ADU, at a simple 1% interest rate. Um, the caveat being that it must be rented to um, deed restricted to, I believe, a Section 8 tenant. Uh, for eight to 10 years. So these are like practices done and examples done statewide at the local level that can be used by localities that want to really um, bolster the intent of the law. At the state level, um, our policy recommendations are, um, there needs to be some clarifying aspects for SB9, it should be expanded upon and really to um, replicate the successes in ADU laws. Um, in 2019, uh, the ADU legislative package um, standardized statewide development fees, permit timelines, unit sizes, and height requirements. Uh, Senate Bill 9 could also expand upon its own law by doing similar, by doing something similar. Uh, this is important because in our um, statewide survey, Turner Center statewide survey, um, we saw that newly constructed ADUs um, most of the units were available to those making 80% area median income. Uh, overall, um, affordability varies by county, but by implementing stricter or more expensive SB9 standards that wouldn't apply to ADUs, localities may be functionally precluding more housing that is affordable to people at, um, a newly, for a newly constructed home. Mm. We also recommend um, tracking SB9 and, um, developments through something similar to the annual progress report or the annual progress report itself and to ramp up enforcement. Um, it's very difficult to track the data on how many localities are um, utilizing the laws or how many applicants are going um, to every um, local jurisdiction, especially if there's 500 of them. Um, in helping increase financing options for um, SB9 to assist with the costs and also to provide grants and um, workforce training programs to um, create more small builders or more nonprofit for profit startups. And in conclusion, the, the extent to which SB9 um, 
will impact housing production across the state is dependent on its effective implementation by local governments. By mandating requirements that hinder the feasibility of um, housing construction, localities might upend the law's um, intended ministerial review and force a revision of um, project to project, um, uh, project to <laughs> project to project approval. Um, while this analysis is specific to California, it offers instructive lessons for other states and communities around the country that are hoping to open up their single family zoned communities to more housing types. It also highlights the challenges that the Biden administration and the state of California will face as it works to encourage communities around the country to relax exclusionary land use and zoning requirements through preferential um, scoring and economic and transportation funding programs, as well as um, proposed planning grants. And I will stop there All and right. pass it back. All right, well, thank you to both Mohammed and Kevin for presentations. Uh, we're going to get into the Q&A portion now. Um, joining us on the panel is going to be uh, both of our presenters. Uh, in addition, uh, we have Eric Preston of Villa Homes and Sam Schneider of Homestead. Uh, and these are both uh, Casita members who are working actively on SB9 projects with homeowners. Um, as a reminder, please uh, post your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, not the chat. Um, and you can upvote questions that are um, that you think you would like answered as well. So you don't have to type out the same question. Um, but given the SB9 and ADU law uh, are apply statewide, we uh, ask you not ask specific questions about your lot or uh, specific situations. Um, we'll answer as many as we can, um, either live or as typed in the Q and A. And if we end up uh, looking like we have enough to go over, what we'll do is we'll wrap up and then we'll stick around for another uh, 10 to 15 minutes to answer any additional questions. Uh, so with that, I um, uh, wanted to get over to Sam and Eric and uh, wondering if you guys can give us a little bit about, you know, some projects you're working on. You know, obviously we've seen some of the challenges uh, from the research perspective, but with the on the ground, you know, boots on the ground experience, you guys are the ones seeing this firsthand. So kick it over to you at first, Eric. Sure. Thanks for the introduction, Jared. My name is Eric Preston. I head up strategic initiatives and business development for Villa. Uh, we build prefab ADUs and now SB9 projects as well. I uh, have completed well over 100 over the last year or two. Um, a one ADUs, I I not SB9 like, projects, correct. <laughs> say again? I said ADUs, not SB9 projects, correct? Correct, yeah. SB9 is, is so new that uh, we're just getting into the implementation process with a number of customers. So we're going through the permitting process now, handling comments on our submitted applications for SB9 projects. Um, the, the, the sort of introductory comment I thought I'd make to any homeowner interested in building an SB9 project is that uh, it's new and it's flexible. So there's a lot of different creative ways you can implement it. One of the most interesting things that we've seen so far on a number of projects is folks who have built ADUs already, then looking to do a lot split after the fact. And that is not prohibited by SB9. It is something we're working on. And it can be a very compelling project uh, because if you've built an ADU already using very streamlined permitting processes, uh, by lot splitting, you can create a very different financial outcome uh, for your project, right? The disposition or the resale of, of both of those housing units separately can be very compelling, as well as opening up your finance, financing options tremendously. Um, so generally speaking, it's very new. There's a lot of creative ways to implement SB9, and I'd encourage folks to reach out um, and get creative, exploring what you can do to add value to your community and to your property. Great, thanks, Eric. Sam, what are you seeing out there in the field? You're on mute, by the way. We are. We're, I'm glad Eric brought up the uh, splitting ADUs. We have a project in San Jose that's uh, submitted uh, where we are splitting off an existing ADU, and that's been an interesting experience. And on the ground, uh, we've run into some of the uh, weird implementation issues where cities who are very pro SB9. Um, are implementing old uh, subdivision rules that make it very restrictive. 
Um, so in Sunnyvale, for instance, uh, which has been a really wonderful department in terms of SB9, they pulled out the uh, parks in Luffy, which is used for very large developments uh, that are supposed to add a park. Uh, but of course, if the development doesn't want to, they give a lot of money to the city based on square footage to build a park. And so this homeowner who is literally just trying to split their existing lot for their parents was charged $100,000 for the parks in Luffy, which made it an economically infeasible project for him. He really wanted to have two parcels so he could get a second loan. Um, and uh, the, I think the city doesn't, you know, its goal is not to do that, but they are just implementing the rules they have for subdivision and sort of that sort of confusion exists even in uh, pro SB9 cities. So we've seen uh, a lot of different interesting things in the ground. Yeah, I, I feel like this is a lot like back in 2017, right? Just to call it the Wild West because there's a lot of creative stuff that you can do as long as you get the right uh, responses from the city and you're able to work it through and in, in, in the way, but you know, it's not, I, it's not guaranteed, um, I think is one of the things that I've seen. Um, with, with regards to that uh, topic, uh, Kevin or Mohammed, um, what's, um, we know with ADU law, uh, HCD has, has quite a bit of authority uh, and quite a bit of uh, enforcement mechanisms. Uh, what's built in SB9 as far as uh, HCD's role in, in review or enforcement because I know it's a little bit different. Yeah, I'll take this one and then it, um, Mohammed could um, jump in if he wants to. Um, HCD does not have the direct authority over SB9 implementation as it does under the ADU law. And I think case in point of that is that unlike the ADU handbook, the HCD SB9 checklist has a very careful disclaimer on the very first page that says that it doesn't represent, you know, the agency's official guidance. Um, I forget the exact terminology, but that was carefully put in there. However, I think that the prevailing sentiment is that HCD has other enforcement options that could in that could touch SB9 in various places, such as housing element enforcement and whether various agencies are submitting, you know, sufficient and timely housing elements um, and how SB9 is a for, you know, contemplated in there for um, reaching certain RENA targets. So there is flexibility, but to answer your question, I believe that the, the agency lacks direct oversight. However, but what we are seeing is I, I'm familiar of at least two HCD letters that while the, the topic and the subject line was not SB9 implementation, they did talk about SB9 ordinances. So um, HCD has been commenting on that in the local level. Yeah, it was. it's interesting because I, I obviously saw that letter and I was, I was thinking back on, I, I don't know how much authority they have to actually, you know, they have over this, but a letter from HCD is always going to uh, have more weight than, you know, a letter from an applicant. So, um, and of course, by you know, people like yourself as well, Kevin. Uh, Mohammed. Yeah, uh, just one thing on, um, first of all, listen to Kevin, he's a lawyer. Um, but one thing when it comes to um, HCD is that um, when it comes to housing elements that SB9 um, parcels are only eligible for housing elements if there's like a site inventory conducted, like it's very technical. Um, so we don't expect a lot of localities to use SB9 parcels for their housing element, which it makes sense that planning departments, especially in this period, aren't really like prioritizing SB9 and not passing ordinances and such because they're so focused on their housing elements. I was, I was gonna ask you, Sam, you're, you're on mute, but um, uh, obviously being you know, on the ground in this, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're seeing that as much as uh, anybody is. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's worse than the early days of the ADU laws because it's uh, two processes in parallel, right? It's a unique building process, approval process, and a unique um, land use process that is quite complicated previously to this law. And hopefully we'll get much less complicated and we'll see that that legislation pour in. Um, so, you know, hint, hint. Uh, but uh, we've seen a lot of chaos and I just want to plug, we've been trying to sort this out for consumers. Uh, if you go to our website, www.homestead.is, 
Uh, you can use the cities guide that we've built. Uh, there are 30 cities where we've compiled as much information as possible uh, and sort of graded them based on policy. Uh, and I also would say that like uh, a lot of the information cities is less than we'd like, but that's all the information cities have to produce. I think Kevin very uh, pointed out something, which is that if you apply today, cities will tell you, you know, wait two to three months because we don't know what we're doing. Um, now it's June and you're still getting the same responses. So that kind of just tells you how it's, how things are on the ground. It also represents an opportunity to get an application in before more restrictive laws have been put in place. Um, we're doing a pretty wild project in, in Santa Rosa that's at the bleeding edge of, you know, what probably will get legislated out of possibility in the future. But right now, um, it's really anything goes as long as you can convince the local city to agree. Yeah. Um, that, that is generally true where cities have adopted the state guidance. And so really it's just zone, it's building in the zoning of the lot. And I think that's something we'd actually really like to see get adopted. Maybe it's a fantasy at the state level, which is, you know, if you're creating a new parcel in that zoning, you should be able to build in that zoning. Um, and I think cities will realize that they are just stepping on their own feet because this is a huge tax base increase, especially the law split provision that didn't exist in ADUs uh, in terms of funding schools and whatnot. And so a lot of their restrictions is just sort of stomping on the feet of their tax base for no reason. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a, on, on that topic, there's a interesting, um, question in the chat about or in the q a about um a track developer splitting multiple um tracks i know there's some provisions in in the law to prevent that um one of you guys want to touch on touch on that briefly make sure that we don't have uh, entire tracks of uh lot split after lot split after lot split yeah, I mean, there's the, uh, I think in the original law, I don't know if this, this made it through the legislation. I, I'm, I'm not as uh, keyed in on the exact wording. You're not allowed to work with the same company to do two lot splits uh, in, in side-by-side -side properties, yeah. adjacent lot splits. Um, and so that is one provision to stop track developers. Uh, the other is just that you have to find a lot of lots where people are willing to move. Uh, so I, I don't think that necessarily, and a lot of homeowners put in them. So I don't think it's a huge risk now, although I know there's a lot of grumbling, um, from the lending conferences and builder conferences I've been to about, uh, restricting to that restrictive, uh, hey, rule, which yeah, I, I think maybe is, is it's a success, you know, speaking yeah, to its success. You, you also have the, uh, the owner occupancy and in quotes, Kevin, you want to, uh, touch on that since you're you're the lawyer here um yeah there's a there's a requirement um that if you're using certain provisions of sb9 you have to attest that one of the owners will live there well sorry it's not live there it's use it as your primary um occupancy for th a three-year period which frankly has raised question when property is being developed and considered for using SB9 by uh, corporate entities that own property rather than, um, you know, specific homeowners. But um, I believe that's the requirement. Um, yeah. How enforceable or how, how um, there's amb ambiguity though in, yeah. in, in, in applying that standard. The other, uh, the other wrinkle there I've heard investor developers discussing the language of the law is a little bit vague and that you know the applicant has to sign this attestation so let's say you own an investment property or plan to lot split it there may be leeway to pre-sell one of the lot split parcels and and have that buyer actually submit the application because they would you know well and truly be intending to live in one of the units once it was split and developed as long as you have a letter of authorization saying that the purchaser can apply on behalf of you, the current owner. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. I think we're, we're coming to a lot of uh, creative um, uses of, of the law and it's something that uh, is going to continue to uh, be a, well, yeah. That's our full intent at Homestead is to make it possible for home buyers soon. So currently our current product helps existing homeowners cash in on their property without moving. 
while creating new housing. And it's something we learned in 2018 when we were talking to people about ADUs. Most of them intrinsically thought you could sell an ADU. Uh, and that was their perf that was their preference. And of course you can't. And so a lot of people weren't looking at a time horizon. The second thing we're developing and working with lenders on today is uh, actually an ability for homeowners to buy homes at a lesser price and work with us to split that lot and sell the back lot. So imagine getting your starter home for $400,000 less. Uh, and I think that that application of the law uh, is a really useful way to do that. And super exciting in terms of, you know, city goals to create more affordable entry level housing. Yeah, I, th I think there's a, a number of questions around uh, financing side that I'd love to get into. Um, and we'll, we'll take this moment to pause and let everyone know we'll be staying an extra 10 or 15 minutes afterwards. Want to, um, you know, thank our panelists uh, and presenters today. Uh, if you miss anything, or if you'd like to view this webinar in the future, it will be on our YouTube channel. Um, uh, that's Casita Coalition's YouTube channel. Uh, we invite other small housing professionals, community-based organizations, and homeowners to add your voice and join the conversation by becoming a member or donating to Casita Coalition. With that, I'll hand it back over to Timothy to wrap up. Thank you, Jared. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks again to our special guests today, Senator Tony Atkins, Kevin Ash with Howland and Knight, and Mohamed Alamaldeen from the Turner Center. Uh, we really appreciate your contributions. Next month's webinar is scheduled for July 22nd at 11 a.m., We'll share information about pre-approved ADU plan programs. And if you'd like to stay with us, uh, stay informed about uh, upcoming in-person events, webinars, and other news, please sign up for a mailing list and consider joining the Casita Coalition. We are a membership organization, and if you like what we're doing, please support our efforts by joining the Casita Coalition as we work more to remove the barriers to ADUs and other small forms of housing throughout California. Also, please like and follow us on social media. We appreciate your attendance today. Thank you very, very much. And we'll see you next month. Uh, we are going to continue the Q&A as we move forward. Thank you again. Have a great day. All right. So with that, um, and kind of jumping back into the topic that we were talking about before we did a little wrap up there, um, financing. Um, this has been a question about um, what ha what's going to happen to that mortgage, what's going to happen, you know, with my lender, um, as you guys are doing these now, and, you know, I, obviously, you're working through some of that. Um, you want to give us a little, you know, primer on what you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, it's an awesome question. And it does vary from lender to lender. Uh, smaller lenders tend to be more flexible. Uh, Lindsay Moon asked a great question about this, which is, so most traditional mortgages have a, uh, a prohibition on subdivision. It violates the mortgage and puts you into foreclosure. And then, of course, if you are able to subdivide, lenders can give you an exception to that rule and waive it. Uh, then you still have to probably move the loan onto one property, you know, pay so you can get a loan to build the second property. Uh, and most lenders are a little squirrelish about that because it requires a partial release of that asset, which is your, your land, uh, that's backing the mortgage. Um, it varies a lot lender by lender uh, and even representative by representative, which in, within larger lenders, so, you know, Bank of America has multiple different mortgage managers. They have many different opinions on uh, if they're going to allow a partial release of the mortgage after the lot split and uh, if they're going to allow a subdivision. One of the easiest ways to do this is to refinance at the approval of the lot split. Uh, but of course, in today's rate environment, that can be quite scary. Uh, we are developing a product, a staple loan product that will allow homeowners to refinance uh, in a traditional conforming loan. And that loan will essentially allow the subdivision um, and partial release and then turn into a conforming loan after that. So allow a one-time subdivision, one-time uh, release. And then their loan will be Fannie Mae and Fannie Mae compliant. So it should be very close to a normal rate regime. There are lenders right now who will do that, but they're often going to charge a rate premium because the sort of loan that uh, allows you to do this is not a conforming loan that that lender can then resell on the market. They would have to quote unquote hold the paper. Um, that was sort of my end to end description. So right now, a lot of challenges, the refinancing for homeowners, uh, especially if you're at a higher loan to value, splitting your lot can be quite daunting. Uh, because a lender may not refinance you on the back end, which would be very scary. You take that risk as a homeowner to build a project. 
Yeah. One other thing I'll say too is just, I think the moral of the story is, is check the loan docs um, because they're gonna be different. Um, there are gonna be sometimes just outright prohib prohibitions on, on using something like SB9. Other times there might be like a lender consent that you can obtain. And there might also be flexibility of like an, an addenda to your, your existing loan docs to allow this process, which is much more flex, like Sam just said, typically is more flexible uh, with the smaller lenders than the big institutions, but um, check your loan docs before you do anything. Yes, don't invest hundreds of thousands of dollars to get to that lot split without reading those law, law docs and uh, talking to Kevin. And if you just scan for um, for uh, subdivision clauses and for partial releases, that'll get you pretty far uh, in terms of positioning yourself in the loan docs. Yeah, the other thing that, that's just coming out, and this is obviously something that's not you know completely understood yet, uh, but Freddie Mac has a new program out that allows uh, um, that, that's intended more for ADUs on multifamily, uh, but allows you to have a, a count rental income. Um, from what I've heard, it's it's a you know essentially the test is you know Freddie Mac usually does the smaller test um, tests and then they you know kick it over to Fannie if it's successful. So uh, some other things to be on the lookout for, and as we move forward. Um, whether or not that's going to apply to SB9, I, I think the jury's still out on that. Well, I think that you're, we're in a better case with SB9 because I would say the argument, if you don't have an ADU, and you just have a duplex when you're building it as a duplex, then it's just owner-occupied multifamily in which you can absolutely count all the other units you're not occupying as, for that uh, income. So yeah. it's kind of like it's already built in. But, you know, of course, that you have to argue that with your lender to figure yeah, it out. Exactly. Hey, hey Jared, uh, I, I hate to report that I do need to jump um, for another call, but yeah. um, thank you so much for having me. This was a really terrific uh, opportunity, and and it was a pleasure to work with Mohammed and present on this topic. So thanks again for Definitely inviting. appreciate you, Kevin. Well, it's a pleasure to work with you, Kevin. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, let's see. Pop into another couple of questions. Uh, there's just some questions that, uh, around, um, and maybe Mohammed, since you've seen, you know, done some extensive research on this, when it comes to access and easements, um, is is it wildly different what cities are, you know, uh, requesting? Um, you know, I think it's one of those. It's it would seem to be fairly straightforward. Um, but you're, you're seeing it, you're, you're nodding your head like, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what, can you give us just some examples of like, what, um, you know, what kinds of easements are being requested, um, whether it's, yeah. Yeah, um, so like we're seeing easements where um, they're, uh, I'm not supposed to use the words excessive, but excessive. Um, they're saying like for a car to enter and it's much wider than a car, right? It's like 20 feet plus um, easement for just like the car to go in. And there's like an additional easement for like utilities and such. That's like uh, very um, large. You're seeing just easements ranging from like, um, if, if they really want to implement the law, it's like eight feet, nine feet. If they really want to like kind of prevent the intent of the law, you're seeing 30 feet easements or even more um so yeah across the state it's just very different numbers and um it's really easy to help ban um geometrically constrain what could be built on an sb9 lot split yeah and i would say financially constrained as well sb9 yeah. doesn't paper out if you can't build if you have to tear down the main unit in most places there are exceptions like you know in the palo altos of the world but generally you need to preserve you can Doing new construction on two units is or four units is much more expensive than just building a duplex in the backyard, right? Um, this is why ADs are so great. And so the lot split provisions, and again, the lot split is also great because it allows you to finance the property separately, right? It's a separate standalone mortgage. It's way easier to build that way. Construction loans are way easier. Uh, but if you use sort of easements to restrict that, then all of a sudden, even if you are very SP9 friendly, but you have to split the lots down the middle, that basically throws out all the pro formas in so many neighborhoods because you have to tear down that original building and is kind of anti-preserving the existing housing, which I think, you know, SP9 is trying to both preserve 
character, but also preserve existing homeowners. And if you have to tear down buildings to, uh, you know, make SB9 work, then you're very unlikely that ho that homeowner is sticking around or is, you know, part of the community mu much longer than three years because they'd probably have to sell. Um, we think... Oh, hmm? Sorry. oh wait, I was just going to say, by complicating, like, easements and everything with an SB9, like, you know, a homeowner could build like a two ADUs on their existing property. Like, why would they go through all this for an SB9 unit if they're just trying to rent it out? So I'm, ta I'm exactly. speaking to a lot of homeowners that are just like, why would I do SB9? I could just build two ADUs and it's all kind of figured out, which really helps, uh, which really like hinders like how many parcels are eligible through, throughout the state and like how many SB9 projects are going to take hold. I'll pass it back to you, Sam. Yeah, yeah and I uh, think it's also like a poor it's kind of a poor tax, right? Because if yeah. you can afford to build two ADUs in your backyard, you definitely aren't um, in the economic situation where SB9 would benefit you, right? Um, most homeowners, most people's time discount of money is not the 10 to 20 years that an ADU makes back, although I think we should all think that way if we have the luxury of doing so. Um, it's uh, how can I make ends meet? How can I pay for my kids' college, et cetera, et cetera. I think SB9 is a direct avenue for that. Uh, but if you restrict it, it's essentially, yes, people who are rational and have money will be like, why would I pay? Well, I'll just build more ADUs. And I think that's you know exactly what we want to avoid. And for the easement thing, I think there's these are really bad faith arguments about fire safety. You know, if you comb around, most cities have six to 10 feet between buildings. Uh, and then to say, oh, I need to drive a fire truck because it's a separate parcel or all of a sudden just for this type of development, I need to get a whole fire truck back there and has to turn around uh, is, is not only, you know, in bad faith, but it doesn't do anything to safety. These places are approving all these sorts of townhome developments, et cetera, that have, you know, no fire access to the back. And so it's, it's uh, we would like to see better compliance moving forward. The other type of easement we're seeing a lot on lot split applications is utility pathway easements to allow your water sewer power to run through or from or across um, a parcel that you still own and have control over, but you know is a separate lot. So um, we'll need permission from the original lot in many cases to run utilities through it. Yeah, that's well, right. Uh, oh, I would say that the utilities part is the true chaos right now because a planning department, you know, they can push this through, but a lot of cities don't have any sort of methodology for if SB9 is adopted at scale, just adding new residential hookups left and right. You know, there aren't even enough whys. So the you know, why is where you sort of have a hookup point on a sewer uh, per parcel. And a lot of parcels, you know, all those whys are built for the existing parcels. Now you can connect at the same Y, but then technically you're overlapping with the existing homeowners. Sewer access, who has to maintain that entry point? These are all things that have to be worked out. And I think we're just in that place where, you know, I, I say 2017, mainly because we're in, we're in the cycle of how government, state government works, which is they tell you what you have to do first and then see how everyone's doing it. And then they come back and refine, and tell you what you have to do and how you have to do it. Um, and so that's what we've done, you know, series of, you know, cycles of that with ADU law. Uh, but part of it, you know, it's, it's extremely difficult to get a bill hundred percent right the first time. Um, and it's also, you know, the, the bad actors, those loopholes that cities find provide you with the justification to come back and clean it up. And, and so you're not, you know, you, you don't look like the, you know, you know, the super bad guy at the, at the start, but you know, you're, you're progressively making, getting it to the same place you wanted to get to, but you're utilizing the justifications of those bad actors along the way to build support. So, yeah. Oh, if we're lucky, right? Like if it's not politically feasible to clean up SB9, we deal with what ADUs had to do for like 30 years, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We hope to have it continue to be politically supported and, and so that we can continue to clean up uh, and uh, really quick, uh, one last question to Eric and Sam, how close are we to a, you know, first project getting through uh, on, with uh, under SB9? Well, if you believe the city of San Jose, uh, two months, maybe even less, maybe a month. 
uh, I, I uh, am not as optimistic, though I, I love pure optimism. Um, and then on our side, a lot of it is dealing with homeowner financing. We have 10 pilot projects and about 150 people signed up to uh, sort of development uh, development term sheets. Uh, but we will very much see if the reality of getting everyone refinanced in a timely manner is even possible at this stage, or if we have to wait um, till banks become more coach in the law, till cities are moving faster to sort of get any mass adoption. So for a lot split, hopefully two months, and then a brand new project. Uh, it depends, but I would say a year away, um, depending because the municipalities where we're doing that and it's, you know, permitting a single family home as opposed to an ADU is a yeah. whole rig around. Yeah. Eric? The first project I would say that has a chance to actually be completed for us is a single, a single unit housing development uh, on the peninsula where we're using SB9 to just apply for one unit as a primary home to avoid a discretionary review process. Uh, that's a bit of a battle, but if it's successful, we could have an approved permit in less than a month. And then the installation would be done in like two months after that. Uh, but there's quite a few ifs there. Yeah. And there was a question in the chat about why anyone would do a one unit SB9 project. And that's exactly the reason why. Instead of discretionary. Yep. Uh, I have another reason, which is that uh, cap, cap rates for sort of how we define value in single family homes in California are ridiculous for single family homes, more so than multifamily. And if you're building in a single family neighborhood, uh, it might be a much easier ask to sell a like-kind asset, like a single-family home in a single-family home neighborhood, than a duplex. Um, but I agree. We want as many units of housing as possible. You want to build as much as possible. But those are that. I think that's a pretty good reason why. All right. Um, I, there, there's one. Uh, I was going to ask Kevin this, but he had to take off. Mohammed, I don't know if you have any uh, information on. Wooey, uh, wild land, wild land, urban in interface, uh, how it's affecting things. But um, I know, I know from where we're at, you know, there's um, cities are trying to find whatever they can to uh, utilize. At least the bad ones are, and sadly, some of the good ones are as well. So that's why we continue working with them uh, and continue working with the uh, local and statewide policymakers here at Casita to really help. Uh, Get, shed light on what their policies actually do and help them create craft uh, better policies moving forward. So with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up. I want to thank, thank everyone for being here today. Um, we will, if the panelists can just stick around for another uh, couple of minutes, we'll do a quick debrief and then uh, get, uh, get out of here. So thank you, everyone. We're going to shut the webinar down uh, and we'll start kicking out here. So thank you, everyone. Yeah, and feel free to use our search tool to make sure your, your parcel is eligible. It works in almost every major city in California that is not in the Central Valley or Inland Empire um, to kick off your process.